Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions tonight. The Shadow Assistant Minister for Universities and Equality, Terry Butler. Economist and commentator, Judith Sloan. Particle physicist and science broadcaster and rock star, Brian Cox. The Assistant Minister for Cities and Digital Technology, Angus Taylor. And futurist, Shara Evans. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Q&A is live across Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio at 9.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. And you can stream us around the world on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. Well, we've got some great science questions for Brian. We'll get to those soon. First, let's go to the chaos that is Australian politics with a question from Pete Johnson. Good evening. Do the pollies take the public as total mugs? I considered standing for the Senate, but desisted due to the dual citizenship rules. Now, if a mere mortal such as me is aware of the relevant laws, how on earth can it be that politicians fail to even ask questions of their parties and the legion of cronies and so-called political advisers? They all knew or should have known for years and kept it as their grubby secret. When will any, just any of our elected representatives of any shade finally and genuinely respect rather than show utter contempt for the people to whom they are supposedly accountable? Angus Taylor. Well, thanks for the question, Pete. And I, I think you're quite right to, to point out that it is incumbent on politicians to rebuild trust with the Australian people. Uh, I think there has been a breach of trust and I understand uh, what, you, what you're saying in that question. Now, there's no quick fix Do you, do you understand one. his point? He's basically saying there's a kind of conspiracy here to hide this grubby secret yeah. from the public. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a conspiracy, but I think you're fair to point out that there's been a breach of trust. And so the critical thing for every Member of Parliament now is to come clean. That is the crucial thing to do because that's how we rebuild trust. Uh, every one of us has to look at our own circumstances and come clean with the Australian people. Uh, it's been disappointing to me that that hasn't happened as quickly as it should have. Uh, I think it's incumbent now on everybody to do that. And that includes the members of the Labor Party. And I still feel as though Bill Shorten is hiding dual citizens in the basement. It's time for everyone to come. So you're away. accusing oh, you're accusing <laughs> Labor of having a grubby. Well, I, I'm saying I, I, I said Tony, everyone needs to come we clean had to on drag this. We've got to rebuild trust. December as a date for disclosure. We had to drag you to that date, the first of December. We don't have anything to hide because our processes sorted this out before people ran. You guys just seem to ignore section. Well, in theory, sorry. I mean, there, well, is, there are really. at least four politicians who are very likely from the Labor Party who are very likely to be sent to the uh, High Court for judgment. All the people you're talking about, Tony, had taken steps to renounce, and the reason they did is because our processes vet people. We check on these things. People take steps. These guys did nothing. They pretended it wasn't even there, and then we had to drag them, kicking and screaming, to the first. How of do December we get to this position, though, when it's day. these guys, not our guys, when ultimately the High Court will make that judgment? Because Tony. What you're seeing is a bunch of Liberals and Nationals, including one Liberal and one National by-election, uh, that weren't eligible to run for the Parliament. Now, I know they like to try to say that this is an everyone problem, but the fact is we had serious professional processes in place, and you can see that because anyone that they can throw a cloud over on our side already took steps to renounce before the election. Uh, well, I'll quickly go back. You, uh, you obviously yeah. want to make a point relating to that. Well, 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 I do, Tony. I mean, uh, it is for the High Court to define what reasonable steps are are, not for the Labor Party, and it is very clear that Justine Kay was a dual citizen, uh, was a citizen of the UK when she was elected to Parliament, and, and that is a very serious issue. It's an issue that the High Court will decide, not the Labor Party. But Angus, you're in, implicit in what you're saying is that she took steps, but John Alexander didn't take steps, Fiona Nash didn't take steps. Well, you, you, you can take whatever take steps, steps you like, Terry, but they've got to be the right steps. Well, maybe and, and that's how, that's how we re-establish trust. Because our we side was right looking steps. at how you deal with this. All right, can I just say that arguing between yours yourselves wasn't. probably won't work. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. No, but no. You bring in someone else. Judith Sloan, um, just take the Labor Party's case for a moment. Uh, there is a High Court judgment, 1992, the Sykes-Cleary case, that might give them some hope. Does it give them real hope? Well, I think Angus is completely right in the sense that uh, it's not absolutely clear what reasonable steps mean. And, you know, you might be right that the Labor Party, you know, took some baby steps, but they may deem to be inadequate. I don't so, think baby steps, though. Well, I think, you know, I think the fact that we had one parliamentarian who was clearly 
a dual citizen at the time of election is an issue for you. And it seems to me that going back to this issue of trust, isn't it something you should actually not be fighting about? Yeah. No, I agree. And say, I actually don't like this provision in, in the Constitution. I mean, it, people who who were born overseas or who have parents who were born overseas, why should they be feeling second-class citizens? I think this is not That's what Australia right. is about. Let's just go to the other end of the panel. Now, Shara, you are, in fact, a dual citizen. I am. I mean, how, do, how does this look? You're an American and an Australian. Yes. Um, how does this look to you? It seems rather ludicrous to me that somebody would actually be running for office knowing that it's not legal, aside from you know whether or not we should make it legal, but if it's not legal to run as a dual citizen and you know you're a dual citizen, then why run in the first place? Yeah, Brian, um, I said in the promo, um, with your sort of long search through the universe for aliens, you never would have imagined finding so many in the Canberra Parliament. I, I, last, last time I was on here, I didn't know that Malcolm Roberts was a fellow Brit. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been nice. It is, we don't you have that... treat him like he was an alien. No? We don't have that provision in, in the UK, though. Um, and as, as you say, I suppose the, the point is that whilst the logic of it I think probably should be questioned. It's an unusual thing. But having said that, as you said, the, the, the fact that lawmakers have to abide by the law and operate it's... within the framework as it exists at the time and then change it in Parliament. And they, they oh, that's definitely... Well, uh, yeah, the only we way we, we could change this one is having a referendum and no-one right. seems willing to do don't that. Have that's one, right. Don't, don't have one of those. <laughs> right, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> Another $100 million. <laughs> yes, this is not one to leave the universe. This is something else. Um, I'll just quickly go back to our questioner. Um, now... You've heard what the politicians have said. You're obviously pretty angry about this. Do you accept um, their explanations? I find it inconceivable. I think, you know, every minister, every MP has so many political advisers, maybe family and friends in the office. You know, nobody ever advised them that this was a problem. Well, this is my nobody point. Nobody saw it coming. I mean, sorry to interrupt you, sir, yeah. but this is actually my point. I mean, in the Labor Party... We filled out paperwork this thick to run for federal parliament. It was vetted by our state branch, our federal branch. And now it's uh, going to be vetted by the high court. And, and when That's people were vetted, and, when, and as is very common, they had a parent who was uh, from overseas, then of course they were advised to take steps and they did take steps. Can I just go, uh, Pete, you, you've come in here quite angry about this. <laughs> um, do you think this can only be resolved by dissolving parliament and having a fresh election? Um, not necessarily, but it's just an endless endless chain of events isn't it like mm. you know with the MPs having their various properties or the expenses yeah, scandals um, chopper gate you know it's always it doesn't meet community expectations we're ever so sorry you know it won't happen again it's just quite ridiculous I so think you, and I think most people think that if I ask you this do you think that this process where everyone has to disclose by the 1st of December will go some way to restoring confidence in whether or not people are eligible to be in the parliament, at least, as a start? Until the next scandal, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Angus, uh, can, I, can I just ask you, uh, wouldn't it be the easiest thing now for the Governor-General to step in, dissolve parliament, and instead of having a whole series of staggered by-elections that go for a long time into next year, just have an election and resolve everybody at once? Well, well I don't think the election resolves the issue. What resolves the issue is people mm. fessing up on mm. their... Citizenship. Yeah, but once, that, once the, they do, it, we, we could be eight well, or nine people down the track. Well, well let, let's see. But that's what has to happen, Tony. And you are absolutely right, Pete. Look, uh, you know, if we are to re-establish trust with the Australian people as politicians, and that is the job of every one of us to do that, and that means coming clean, and that is the only way we'll resolve the issue. But that doesn't... I mean, his point is, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but... His point is this come clean process that's been created where everyone discloses by the 1st of December, that only deals with this issue. You're saying this is an example of a much bigger issue of trust where people think that elected members of parliament are just not going to do the right thing. And so we actually have to, in order to deal with that, not just deal with citizenship, but deal with the standards of conduct that people engage so Terry, in public Terry life. So Terry Butler, should there be an election? Oh, I think there should be, actually. I think that's pretty clear. And it does resolve this issue because nobody's going to be silly enough, I wouldn't have thought, uh, to run for the next general election would, without would, getting... Would you as a Labor MP be happy to see the Governor-General step in and dissolve... I don't power. want to see a dismissal. Mm. That's not what I'm advocating for at all. I think that any Labor MP would be horrified by the idea of 
the vice regal representative in Australia coming in and dissolving a government, but Malcolm Turnbull could very well do the right thing and call an election. And but that does a quick one to Judith, issues. election or not? I mean, is this the best way to resolve it with so many cases pending? I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, Peter, I wish it were simple. I mean, you see the case of, of my friend Josh Frydenberg, whose mother came here stateless from Hungary, who may be unwittingly roped into being a Hungarian citizen without his knowledge. Well, th the trouble is each case is individual. I mean, it seems to me if someone's born overseas, clearly they kind of got to work it out. If your parents are born overseas, that becomes a bit more complicated. So that's the only thing. It, as, I mean, I think sadly, and I, 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 I hear your frustration, is that it all has to be worked out on an individual by individual basis. So it's not actually clear that having an election would solve that. You say people wouldn't put themselves up unless they were absolutely sure, but it is a really complicated issue in, in many cases, including what country people were born well, then, with boundaries changing But in what the do life. you do about it then? Because a process for the current cohort of MPs only affects the current cohort of MPs. If you're saying having another election won't fix anything, mm. then that necessarily implies that we'll have in the next parliament the same problem. No, no, well, I think it has to be sorted out, you know, in the next six to, to, to uh, 12 months. I mean, we were talking about this... Does this uh, government last that long? Well, the <laughs> thing about it is that it's this is the classic black swan, it seems to me, that, in fact... The truth of the matter, if someone wants to go and look at the records, there were absolutely heaps of Section 44 violations over the years, in my opinion. Um, I can think of some off the top of my head. But it was because, you know, there was some guy, some barrister in Western Australia decided to bell the cat with uh, one of the Green senators, and it's all unravelled from that. So it's one of those terrible things that I think's just got to be sorted out to the point where every individual commands uh, the confidence of everyone that they meet Section 44. OK, let's move on. The next question is from Howard Sofa. Hi, Tony. Um, with the Liberal Party not standing up for their traditional values and the Labor Party abandoning its traditional base for populist and identity politics, why are we so surprised at Pauline Hanson's high polling numbers? Angus Taylor. Yeah, look... Um, I understand the question, Howard, and uh, th to me, the Liberal Party side of it, which is the part I can talk about, I'll leave the Labor part to, to Terry. Thanks, Angus. Uh, the key to the Liberal Party is this fusion, this combination of classical liberalism and conservatism. We have always been at our best when we're like that. Uh, I don't think we've abandoned it. I think we have those two parts of the party, and the main thing, uh, as we just saw in the Four Corners com uh, the, the, the Four Corners documentary, is to keep that balance. If we keep that balance, are you out of balance continue... at the moment? Is no, I, I, I don't think we are actually. Tony Abbott this... says you are. Well, I, I don't think we are. <laughs> I think we have a balance. There will always be, as there is in the Labor Party, tensions between people with different points of view. That's a good thing. That's what democracy is all about. But it has to be that balance between those two traditions, those two great traditions, which have served our party so well for so long. That was a question uh, at the heart of it was the rise of one nation, yeah. which you've neatly avoided. Um, well, well, I, does I the, haven't. Does the, Liberal, does the Liberal Party reject um, the rise of one nation? Will you reject one nation as they as they gain more power? If, if we are the home of both classical liberals and conservatives, we are the home of people who might otherwise choose to vote One Nation, Tony. And, and this is the key, is that we, we have to get that balance right. Saying that we, I think we are getting saying that balance that right. Do you have a certain respect for the values of One Nation? No, I have respect for people who are conservatives, many of whom live in my electorate. Uh, uh, th they are good people. Uh, they firmly hold their beliefs. Uh, and we should show them respect and we should incorporate people with those beliefs in our party. Yes, but you're not incorporating them, you're giving them your preferences in Queensland. No, I, I'm so, talking about uh, conservatives, 50, not one 50 name. seats in Queensland are being preferenced, uh, Liberal preferences are going to one nation ahead of the Labor Party. Well, I'm, I'm not going to speak for the Queensland Liberal Party. I, I represent it's federal, the, federal, the federal Liberal. Well, well it's indefensible. You, 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 can, you can say whatever you like, Terry, but I speak for the federal... Liberal Party. And uh, the truth is that as long as we get that balance right, um, I think there is room for that broad church within the Liberal Party. All right, Terry Butler, the rise of One Nation in Queensland must be concerning for both parties. Well, look, I think, you know, you can talk about Liberal values and the Labor Party's values, but if you want to talk about what One Nation is, 
Well, Nation's the home of drama. I mean, they've got more drama than an episode of Real Housewives. And I don't think they have values. Uh, I think they're a collective of opportunists. And that's what we're really seeing in Queensland. And it is indefensible, frankly, for the Queensland Liberals and Nationals to be preferencing to them. They're going to try to help get One Nation people elected into the Queensland Parliament uh, because their plan is to elect One Nation uh, into a crossbench and then form government with their support. That's the only plan that the Liberal so Just National incidentally, Party will you be Queensland. using, will the Labor Party be using that fact heavily in the Benelong by-election where oh. um, uh, John Alexander is, uh, has a, an electorate with a lot of Asian people? I, I think it's very Asian clear. Descent that we will make clear that the Liberals and One Nation are allies in Canberra. One Nation votes with the Liberals the overwhelming majority of time. And we will also be pointing out all of the things that the Liberal National, uh, that the coalition government has sought to do, including in relation uh, to citizenship and tests around English speaking uh, and values. And I think that people in Benelong will be concerned about the multicultural policies of this Turnbull government and its closeness to One Nation. Judith. I think it's really important for us not to be too parochial in thinking about this. I mean, this is actually, and, and Brian, you, you, you would no doubt have views on this from the UK and Shara in the US, that there is, I think, um, a splintering of political support. Uh, we're getting this fragmentation. Uh, it seems that almost um, instead of the... Um, the dominance of the, the, the big parties, we're getting sort of tribal, tribes essentially moving away, feeling that the big parties are, dare I say, uh, Angus, a bit of a blancmange. Uh, you say you're trying to keep the, the, the classical liberals and the conservatives together, but there's a price for that. Um, and so if there's a stronger voice, for example, for the conservatives, there is always a risk that they will splinter off. And this is happening around the world. And it's also, I I'll think, just ask Brian it's about connected that. to social media, yeah. isn't it? Because it, it's now possible to have voices which are directed to these tribes in a way where we used to have, uh, you know, broader popular culture, broader press and broader media. You know? Brian, what do you think about that? I mean, One Nation is effectively Australia's UKIP, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. You're right. This fragmentation is happening across the world. Um, I, I, um, I read an interesting series of lectures by Robert Oppenheimer. So, in, so he was the father of the atom bomb. Mm. And in 53, he did a, a series of lectures called the Reef Lectures for the BBC, in which uh, they were disappointed at the time because he didn't talk about the atomic bomb at all. And I think they thought he was going to. He talked about what th thinking in a scientific way or, or like you're thinking in the way you're forced to do by nature as a scientist, what that can bring to politics and he drew a, I thought a really powerful distinction he said that so let's say very quickly I'm not going to give you a lecture on quantum mechanics but very quickly in quantum mechanics one of the things you're forced to do because that's the way that nature behaves is is to consider sometimes a little particle as a little billiard ball that bounces around but some other times it behaves a little bit like a, a wave and so you have this what it used to be called complementarity complementary descriptions and he made an analogy he said well in Political philosophy, so let's say conservative political philosophy, you may well weight the freedom of the individual above all else. So you, you'll start almost with an axiom of freedom of the individual and you'll build in a cohesion, a community cohesion. Whereas if you go to the, the left of politics, you may well take community as a basis, certainly if you're a, a communist, if you're way over there, and then you might build in a bit of freedom. And he said, no, that what, if you think scientifically, you have to hold those two almost what we might call orthogonal or almost con contradictory ideas in your head at the same time in order to get a complete picture of the way that a country must be run. It, that, that's the way that you prevent tribalism. So it, it almost mitigates against a very polarised two-party system because he, he was arguing that you have to hold simultaneously these competing views. I suppose Oppenheimer mind. would have had to have held uh, competing ideas in his head when he thought that the atom bomb equaled peace. Well, I think that was one of his motivations, actually, because he felt very strongly that the, the power that science and engineering and thinking in this way had delivered to politicians would not be handled by the political structure. And he was actually wrong. Um, it actually, he, he felt he was surprised in 1953 that we were still here and we're still here now. So actually, the, the political systems we have in the world did manage so far to control that power. And we're still here for other questions. We've got another one from Jess Lees. 
Last week, self-described working class patriots posted a video of themselves hurling racial abuse at Sam Dastyari to Facebook. It's long been a calling card of alt-right nationalists that their right to vilify and promote bigotry is protected by freedom of speech. How, in an age of instantaneous media communication, um, can we censor bigotry and discrimination, especially when prominent figures such as Pauline Hanson refuse to condemn those who participate in hatred and division? Shara, can I bring you in? Um, I guess we are living in the future when um, two overtly racist gentlemen with an iPhone film a racist encounter uh, with a politician of Iranian descent. Um, it's a strange picture to see it, um, but is it, uh, are you able to stop it? Uh, that would be very difficult, especially with real-time media. Um, for instance, if you think about Facebook or Twitter or any other social media outlet, once that video is out there and someone else retweets it or reposts it, how do you then stop all of those repostings? It, it becomes a near impossible problem in real time. And even with technologies like artificial intelligence, how do you actually scan for prejudicial action or racial slurs or ethnic slurs? You know, it, it's a very difficult problem. And as we're more and more connected in this world, unfortunately, I think we're going to see more people take this kind of technology and abuse it, as well as use it for the benefit of people. Angus, it is a, a difficult problem. <coughs> Nonetheless, um, you would imagine uh, most politicians would condemn it outright. Yep. Um, Pauline Hanson did not do that, mm. and that's part of the gravamen of that question. Mm. Um, what do you say? Well, she should have condemned it. Mm. Um, that's clear. But yeah, I, I have a very firm view, Jess, that uh, freedom of speech <laughs> actually does solve this. <coughs> human beings are inherently good. They inherently understand what is right. And uh, the important thing is for people to condemn behaviour that is unacceptable. And if we do that, if all of us do that, we don't need laws to do it. The community can do it. People can do it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why freedom of speech is such a powerful principle. Brian, what do you think? Th this is a, a big issue, actually. No, the, the specific issue, but the freedom of speech issue in mm -hmm. Britain, there's a big issue in universities, as there is in the US, about um, how which ideas are acceptable to discuss in, in a university forum. Now, now I agree with you very strongly that I think if, if not in the university, then where? Mm. However, there is, of course, the balancing argument is that at university we have people who are essentially 18 years old coming into that environment for the first time. And there is a duty of care in the university to, to make sure that everybody can can function and feel safe and can learn. So, so there is a, there's a competing, there are competing ideas here. But, but as a university professor, I, I very firmly believe that ideas, all ideas must be discussed in a civilised fashion. And as you say, that, that, that also allows our society to roundly condemn abhorrent ideas. Yeah, so do you um, dislike the fact that in universities in Britain and in the United States, um, certain speakers have been banned from, from addressing student audiences? Yes, I do dislike it because I think that the, the, how people hold abhorrent ideas in society. Mm. And so what, the, the question is, so we all accept that, the question is how do you confront them? How do you deal with them? So you can censor them or you can expose them for what they are in the way that we do, in a civilised manner. And, and my view is that that confrontation in a civilised forum, which is safe in a sense, is, is the way to confront these ideas. Terry Butler. Well, there are fetters on free speech, of course, at law. And uh, I've read a news article today about that particular incident involving Senator Dastiari, which indicates that there is some legal action being taken. And that legal action that's being taken is copyright breach because the name that these guys used for their ultra-nationalist group was taken out of uh, Romper Stomper. Um, I know, right? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, so that's a fetter on free speech. And I don't think anybody should, would realistically say that we shouldn't have copyright laws or that we shouldn't have laws that go to misleading and deceptive conduct in trade and commerce. It so wouldn't really matter what they were called, it's what nah. they did that counts. Yes, but my point is there are, there are legal bounds on freedom of speech and its exercise. 
I think Angus is absolutely right to say that the most important way that we have to respond to hate speech is culture and making sure that we have a culture that does not give licence to hate speech. And I also think that some laws uh, can support that culture. Some restrictions can support that culture. And, and we're not talking here about the free exercise of, of speech to debate ideas at university. We're talking about people who called a senator a terrorist and a monkey because of his Iranian background. Uh, so I don't think our laws as they exist are unreasonable. So just, just very briefly, are you saying that their freedom of speech effectively should be curtailed I'm, when it comes to making racist comments? I'm suggesting that their freedom of speech is curtailed because there are laws both in relation to property rights, copyright and uh, racial vilification that exist in this country and I'm saying that that's not a particularly bad thing. But much more important than those laws is the culture that we allow to, to grow up around our country and that really goes to leadership and the issues that Angus was talking about. Judith. Well, I mean, I think the, the key is, well, there are two keys. Uh, first of all, civil discourse and that, of course, involves not calling people appalling names and the like. And, of course, non-violence. Um, but, you know, we shouldn't just be picking on these two blokes. We've had quite a few in instances of inappropriate behaviour from both the left and the right. Um, and the thing is, it's, it's inexcusable. And, I, I mean, I am worried about universities. I mean, we've got some uh, lovely young people here. But, I mean, I don't think you're all so precious that you can't deal with controversial ideas. In fact, that really is... The purpose of university life is to actually, you know, deal with contentious issues for you to make up your mind. And I don't think being protected from uh, certain speakers or certain topics is the way forward. And it worries me. It worries me particularly maybe in the US more than the UK. Um, and but, but perhaps even here. So I think it's really important that we establish the framework for these discussions, but we really need to have open discussions about all sorts of topics. As I just say, I do think there is a place for, for law. I mean, as you said, that, that we do have laws in Britain and Australia and elsewhere in the civilised world, and that, that there is certain, there are certain forms of abuse that are illegal, but that's a very high bar, and it's uh, argued through the courts, and so it should be. You're saying it should stay high. Um, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. <laughs> Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question comes from James Raggett. Hi. Uh, my question is for everyone on the panel. Uh, the rise in digital and biotechnology is uh, swiftly reshaping our social, cultural, political interactions on a vast scale and, and to an often overwhelming uh, rate. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the kinds of legislation we should be discussing over the coming decades to not only keep up with but safely manage the threats ethical and practical that these changes pose to the human race and what kind of uh, consequences we should be expect if we don't uh, step up to that challenge. Shara, start with you. Uh, James, that's a fantastic question and the accelerating pace of technology is getting faster and faster all the time because we're already at a high stage and our technological capabilities are right now and have been for many, many years doubling every 18 to 24 months. So we're starting to go up on a curve that's heading like this. And that means that technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics suddenly will start taking over jobs, routine things, repetitive processes that many people wouldn't be expecting to happen so quickly. And we need to think very carefully as a society about the ethics that we use when we look at introducing automation into the workplace and whether we're going to look at automation as a replacement for human labor or an augmentation. And I think the better use is as an augmentation, get rid of all the boring stuff that people do and automate the things that might be routine and allow people to use their um, value and creativity. But there are some other really scary things that I think we need to be cognizant of, and in particular security and privacy and ethics. Because when you have artificial intelligent networks, particularly with a technique called deep learning, you have software that is basically 
allowing big data to be fed into these AI software constructs. And it may be social media data, YouTube um, videos, it could be databases, all sorts of things. And the software learns by basically sucking in information from these millions and millions of data points and unconsciously can pick up social biases, the sorts of things we were talking about in the last question where you've got morals and you know some people who like to spout hatred and other things that as a free society we consider distasteful. Well, we saw from the United yeah. States the last election that you can actually target groups of people using that kind of technology. Absolutely. And if we start to have AIs that have these capabilities and are sucking in these unconscious social biases, and we don't have humans in the loop checking that the inputs from um, all this massive data are congruent with the outputs, the decisions that are being reached, then we can end up with some serious issues. But there are also things like privacy. And here I'm thinking of the <coughs> growing um, dominance of technologies that are voice enabled, things like Amazon Alexa or OK Google or Siri or all these other digital assistants that are always listening, always recording, and in some cases selling the data to third parties. And it's not just on an individual basis that we need to consider these technologies, it's also on a business basis too. Because if you've got a smartphone and it's always on, always listening, and you're in a boardroom and you're discussing a potential merger and acquisition, and that data is being recorded and possibly on sold, there are some serious ramifications because the company may not even know it's happening. Well, let's ask uh, Angus Taylor, uh, the, the question the questioner asks whether there's a role for government here in legislation, whether that legislation will have to keep pace with this incredible rate of change that we're dealing with. Yeah, well, of course we do have to, and we are facing a, a, a large rate of change. One of the issues is jobs. I'll come back to that. But the, 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 I think the main question that James was asking was about the ethics of, uh, uh, of how these changes are, are taking place. The way I look at it and the way the government is looking at it is the starting point is that the customer or the citizen must be in control of their, mm. their data. Uh, that is absolutely central. And in very practical terms, this means, for instance, your banking data, your energy usage data, your telecommunications data, you have to be in control. Uh, the Productivity Commission's put down out a very good report on this recently. We're working through it now. But that's the fundamental principle. And if we start from that principle, then I think a lot of the ethical issues are much easier to deal with uh, as long as we start from that point. With isn't the, isn't the, the, the whole point that uh, Shara was making, that uh, these huge corporations, uh, Google and yeah. you name it, um, are actually designed to get around yeah. your privacy? Well, so, so this, is, this is a big issue. And the customer being in control of their own data, um, you know, it, it will come into tension with... with many organisations that have a, have a lot of data. I'm less concerned... Will you, will you need to regulate it? Uh, well, yes, of course. I mean, look, ultimately we would like industry to regulate it themselves. <coughs> We're working through this very practical example of this in open banking right now. The UK has gone through the same process where we're saying we want the customer to have control of their own data, we want the industry to come to its own conclusions, but the government will step in if it can't sort it out. And, and I think that's the right way to go about it. Yeah, it's um, a very curly problem, though, because you have services, um, Google in particular, that are built on giving really cool stuff to people for free yeah. on the trade that you're actually making your data available for them to mine and scour and resell. And I don't know that a little country like Australia is going to change Google's global practices. And not only that, but in any software, you typically have these click wrap legal terms and you either say yes and probably don't read the actual terms yeah. or you decide not to use the software. Yeah. And through social pressure and media and everything else, yeah. a lot of people just decide to use it yeah. without knowing the ramifications. How do you Brian? control that private data? Brian, should we be worried about this? Well, yeah, I think there are two other questions uh, as well, I think, in the question, is, uh, question I've said question three <laughs> times. Uh, what one is that, that you see often, so Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking have been having quite a lot of press recently for raising issues about artificial, concerns about artificial intelligence. And I think one of the concerns would be if you um, 
sub out decision making to um, expert systems, which we're doing at some level already. Mm -hmm. But let's say you sub out the decision making for, in an extreme case, nuclear war to an expert system. Then it is true that you could probably write an algorithm to, to, to run your defense forces such that if you saw a particular threat to your country, you would uh, deliver some kind of military response. You could imagine possibly that. But that runs the risk of removing human morality from the decision making. Now, that is an extreme example. But it is already happening. I mean, uh, there are uh, targeting, uh, uh, automatic targeting, targeting weapons in the US military. There are. So, so, so and, and you could, you know, extend that to the whole nuclear deterrent. And then you have, a, I think, a real potential threat to civilization without... Thank God we have Donald Trump in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> He's an argument for automated decision making probably at the moment, but in general. But so I think that that's, that's problem number one, which is, which is to what level do you allow automatic, autonomous expert systems to make decisions which may be, it may be good to have a moral component in those decisions. The, the second one, very quickly, is I was at a conference the other week, an EU conference on uh, research and innovation, and someone said something very interesting, which is when we talk about jobs being um, destroyed by automation, the, the, almost a the definition of your innovation system is that it, re it, it replaces the jobs that it destroys with new jobs, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it creates new jobs faster than it destroys old ones. And that's probably But only the for way... people with the requisite education. Well, exactly. So, so the challenge for government is to make sure that it has a research, innovation and education system that creates new jobs and educates the workforce faster than the old jobs. You can't hang on to the old jobs. We will have driverless cars. We will have these. So those old jobs will be destroyed. They always have been. But it's government's responsibility to make sure the ecosystem works to create more new jobs than are destroyed. Terry Butler. Uh, well, I guess a range of things come out of that, but uh, ultimately what comes out of it is a question of power. And when we see a situation where more and more data comes into existence, then the real question is how do we make sure that the power over that data resides with the people uh, whose interests it should serve and not the people whose interests uh, it would serve absent some sort of structure or a response to that. Um, and so I think... It, this is a really, this question is really connected to the first question we had, which is about trust in democracy. Because the only real force against corporate use of our data and of our property is democracy and the collective way that we can stand together uh, as a community against the interests of very wealthy and very powerful. You just heard uh, Shara's answer to that, which is a small country like Australia has no chance. Yes, and I heard that. And, and I wanted to well. say an even smaller country like Estonia manages to have a system where every single person can see every time their data is accessed. Mm -hmm. uh, and we might be a small country when it comes to standing up to Google or Apple, but we are nonetheless a country of 23 million people who collectively can decide what laws operate here and the ways in which they are enforced. So I, I don't think we should write off democracy yet. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I did want to say something about the um, AI and the, and the Stephen Hawking's and Elon Musk comments. I was on a panel, it's interesting, the other day we were talking about Robert Oppenheimer as well. Uh, and there was a sort of view that said if everybody had just taken a bit more of a pause before the creation of, of atomic weapons, maybe we'd be in a different world now. And I do think it is worth saying, let's take a bit of a pause and think through the ramifications of AI, not just what might be able to work with, uh, with different algorithms that are written, but, you know, I don't want to see the, the plot of Terminator 2 come true. And by that, I mean... We should be concerned and thinking about what might be the ramifications of self-aware technology and what that, might, what that might mean for us. And when you've got people with serious intellectual heft saying this to us, I think it, it does suggest that there's some room for some thoughtfulness and some, um, some response to this. Uh, and that does lead back, I think, to governments taking a, a sensible and considered look at it. So to answer your question, uh, yes. Judith. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how you would affect a pause. That is the trouble. I mean, you know, the, the thing is, this is a, happening at a giddy pace uh, in all, you know, in lots of sectors in all parts of the world effectively. I mean, let me just uh, concentrate on the issue of the impact of technology and jobs, which is kind of one of my areas. I mean, this fear goes back a very, very long time, uh, toll puddle martyrs and the like. Um, and I think, I think we knew the answer. I think where technology was replacing 
muscle effectively, you know, human uh, physical toil, it basically has been a very positive outcome and there have been more jobs uh, replacing. There are always losers in this, but uh, I think that's fairly clear. It's more complicated when it's replacing lawyers. I think it's much more complicated because I think effectively this new technology has got cognitive function. You know, you're kind of replacing, certainly in, for repetitive functions, stuff that requires brain power. So, you know, I think it's, this is a fantastic topic of conversation, um, but I don't know whether we're going to pause it, but we really have to realise that there will be losers and they're going to be a kind of group of losers that who wouldn't actually necessarily have seen themselves as vulnerable. Mm. Yeah. Uh, they may be university educated, for example, uh, and probably will be, uh, but if they're uh, in jobs at the sort of more routine end of the spectrum, then they're very vulnerable. So this is, I think, something for government to keep a very, very close watch on. That probably okay. implies lifelong <coughs> learning though, doesn't it? Yep. And fitting learning into work, yep. which is really, you know, we think about university as a kind of an atomised thing you do a, a degree. Terry, I'm going to have to uh, cut you off there. That is a point we've covered a few times on different programs. So we'll go to so. next question. We'll go to Orbit <coughs> with uh, George Jovanovsky. Uh, Professor Cox, in the context of the world's energy crisis and climate change, you've suggested that we should actually use more energy as opposed to less. And this can help you know, advance societies by particularly improving living conditions in developing countries. And the way that we could do this is by moving uh, the production of energy from Earth and into outer space. So our planet becomes essentially residential. Now, this all sounds very science fiction, but I hear it's maybe not. Can you help us understand why? Yeah, and I didn't quite say that's kind of a, a, a mishmash of things that I talked about over the years. So that when you put it like that, it sounds ridiculous, and it is. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, what, what, um, what, what I, I just made a program actually for the BBC um, about commercial space flight. And uh, I was fortunate, I got to speak in particular to Jeff Bezos at some length, who's the Amazon CEO and has got the company Blue Origin. I also spoke to Elon Musk. And um, what, what struck me was that there is a... It, Jeff Bezos says very clearly, his company's called Blue Origin because this is the best planet we know of, right, number one. So his focus really is how do you protect this planet whilst at the same time having an exciting, growing, an interesting civilization in which the future is better than the past. So how do you do Now, they seem very difficult to square because it is clear that we can't continue to accelerate resource use on, on Earth. We have a problem with energy production at the moment. Um, so how do you do it? And his answer is quite simple. You begin, you begin to industrialise orbit, which we've already done, actually. I mean, it, communication satellites and all those things, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. But you begin to exploit the resources which are available off Earth, not too far, not outside the solar system. Even there's one number that people like to quote, which is there's, there's enough metal in the asteroid belt to build a skyscraper 8,000 storeys tall and cover the Earth in it. So in other words, there's effectively unlimited resources and unlimited power. And so I think what these people are doing, um, the, the, the big companies now, the big rocket companies on the west coast of America, um, the, are, are, they are trying to begin to industrialise orbit and beyond in order to take the pressure off Earth. And, and Jeff Bezos does say, you know, his, his goal would be to zone the Earth light, industrial and residential at some point in the future. <laughs> and, and now this sounds ludicrous. However, the key jump in technology is reusable rocket technology, which, is, which has reduced the cost massively. So it is now the case that entrepreneurs, and there's large capital going into space mining companies and things like that, particularly in the States, entrepreneurs can begin to look to move into orbit. So that, that's what I, I, I don't think anyone's gonna build a power station in orbit and beam free power to the earth or anything. <laughs> but, but, I, I, but I do think the beginnings of that industrialization of space are, that's here. Yeah, any time, any sort of time scale around this, Brian, come to mind, I mean, oh, is it 100 years, No, years? no, no, oh. the people I spoke to, uh, it's 10 years. I mean, there are big companies with big investment, billion dollar companies. There's even talk of the first trillion dollar company and people speak of that as being the company that begins to mine. And, uh, and actually, I, just very briefly, I was at a, a <coughs> conference in Luxembourg, and Luxembourg have taken the lead on this, particularly the legal framework 
Um, and so, the, the, and also there's a big act in Congress that's gone through, so, that, so the, the mining rights in space, all those things, the legal frameworks are in place. And so I think it will be a great growth industry, which is why Australia's right to, to begin to build a, a space agency and begin to look at that, that framework to get those private companies in. Mm. Now, Angus, is that, uh, I mean, are you actually <laughs> thinking that BHP goes into orbit? Maybe we should <laughs> put the space agency into the National Energy Guarantee. Mm. We can solve yeah, we a couple of problems there. But look, um, uh, you know, we are having a fair bit of trouble producing reliable, affordable energy here. So that's got to be our focus, obviously. But I, I'm a great believer in the potential of technology in time. You can't for it's very hard to predict the timelines of these things. Um, if there's one thing I've learned in my commercial career, my business career, is when you predict the timelines, you almost invariably get them wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, usually they take a bit longer than you think. Uh, but, but I do firmly believe that technology... Well, we do elect governments to plan for the future. Well, and, and what you have to do is you have to plan for a future where there's uncertainty. That's the truth, because we don't, we don't know how some of these technologies are going to unfold. What I would say is that I think it's crucial uh, that government policy, including in areas like energy, we allow for that uncertainty in technology. Uh, you know, the, one of the points we've always made on energy is allow for that uncertainty. Don't, don't rush it, because... Technology will have big impacts over time, cumulative impacts over time, and, and have a policy that adjusts for that. Shara. Now, I was going to say and agree with Brian. We are in one of the most exciting times in human history when it comes to space exploration, and in particular led by the private sector. And I think your time frame of 10 years is probably about right for the beginnings of real space exploration, with the reusable rockets being the real driver that will make it feasible. One of the things that I recently read is that there is enough um, heavy hydrogen on the moon to literally power nuclear fusion reactors, which are still in the realm of science fiction, for the entire Earth for tens of thousands of years. You know, if we it's a long get time heads... since we put anyone on the moon, though, Sharon. Well, but it's possible again now with reusable rockets. But aside from going into space, when it comes to energy, I think we need to look a lot more at renewables too. Solar energy, wind energy. Um, there's a company that's based in Australia called Infratech that is doing floating solar panels that is able to produce more energy from the these panels that are in bodies of water than you could get from rooftop solar because as it turns out, when you cool the solar panels with water, it's much more energy efficient. And they've recently sold the technology into Holtzville, California, which until recently was very drought stricken. And they're buying thousands of these solar arrays, mounting them in lakes and bodies of water and saving the land for agriculture. And not only that, but they've combined it with water treatment so that you're getting a two for one effect. And if there's an earthquake, and unless it's a really big one, the solar panels just sort of float along. So I think there's some, all, some interesting earthbound innovation in energy that we can also look at. Yeah, can I just add very quickly, I mean, if you look at the, this is an area where you said that technology moves fast. It, renewable energy is something that's taken everybody by surprise in the last few years, actually. I think solar power has dropped by 90%. So, so a lot of the politics around renewable energy is, now, is, now, is almost becoming redundant because it's the, the market driven. I, I think two thirds of investment in new power in 2016 was renewables. Why? Well, partly things like the Paris Agreement and things like that, but, but primarily because it's just getting cheaper because the rate of innovation is so high. Well, moving to our next question because they're all related in a sense. It comes from Zach Tan. So this question is for Professor Brian Cox. We've got a whole lot of flat earthers, climate change deniers, and all sorts of um, conspiracy theorists who don't value the truth and scientific evidence. So surely providing more evidence isn't the answer for these people. So here's my question for you, Professor Cox. How do we engage with these people in conversations to make them question their beliefs and even possibly change their minds? Oh, it's one of the central questions. I think a very serious question we face is a as a society. Um, I, th I think the, the, the dividing line, one of the dividing lines in society has been pe between people who um, understand modelling uh, and, and so understand what it is and, and respect it to some extent with appropriate cynicism or, <laughs> and then people who don't. And so you see this in economic modelling. So for example, in, in the UK with the, with the uh, Brexit vote, there was a wide scale rejection 
of, of economic modelling. Now we can all argue quite rightly about how, so. Well, we can argue about <laughs> quite how, rightly so. It was how, terrible. We can argue about how accurate it is, but uh, same with climate. It, and, and my, the, the, well, if you just to take that point, not to be deflected too much, but it, the, what else can you do? I mean, it, climate's a, a good example. I mean, if you're charged with um, the question, the appropriate question, what will the climate be like in 2050 or 2100 if uh, we carry on with greenhouse gas emissions at this rate? And the, what can you do? You have to try and answer it. And all you can do is use our knowledge of physics and meteorology to, to model and see what we get. Now, the, and, and you have big errors on there and they can become smaller as you get better and so on. So, so I think there's a, there's a, we, we have a job to do in, in, in trying to convince people that, that, that expertise is, is you're, not, you're not to listen to experts like there's some kind of priests on top of a mountain. I mean, science has never been that. Science has always been about questioning the orthodoxy. But at the same time, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't decide, there's a, there's a cartoon in one of the UK papers of um, all the passengers saying it's our democratic right to land this plane. And I don't care who you are, Mr. Pilot at the front there, because we think we can do it better than you, so we'll land it. And you end up with a big hole in the runway if you do that. So, um, so, so I think that it, the it's, trouble, it's Brian, probably, really is... just to finish, it's probably about, it's the, it's about education and it's about instilling in people an appropriate amount of trust in expertise um, without um, having people follow everybody, every expert down now, the Judith, road just hold your horses sheep. for a minute, because and everyone else, because um, I'm just going to go to another question related to this. Patrick uh, Mellahone, McElhone, I beg your pardon, McElhone. Uh, yes, my question is for Mr. Taylor. Uh, you have stated that <coughs> man-made global warming has little basis on fact and everything to do with blind faith. Do you stand by this statement? And if so, please explain why you, as Minister for Cities and Digital Transformation, choose to reject the findings of scientists such as Brian Cox in favour of climate change scepticism. Well, I haven't said that. Uh, I have been, uh, I, in fact, for a long time, I've thought that climate science should be treated with a lot of respect since the 80s indeed. What I have been very sceptical about is some of the economic modelling and the policy that has flowed from it. Uh, and can, I just, can I just interrupt when you say you haven't said it? Because you've been quoted in The Guardian as having said the following <laughs> in Parliament. The new climate religion recruiting disciples every day has little basis in fact and everything to do with blind faith. Well, well th that was with reference to the economics. Oh. That was with reference to the economics. And I have been very clear on this at all times, Tony. And in fact, if you read the broader context of that speech, it was about the economics. And I am deeply sceptical about a lot of the economic modelling that has played out in this space. I mean, from the 1980s, I had a great interest in this area. Um, you know, my own commercial operations we've, in, in agriculture, we have used the climate modelling of the CSIRO uh, for our commercial decisions. Um, and uh, so I respect the science enormously. But what I don't respect is some of the economic work that has been done around it, which maybe, has been which has been appalling and has led us. Let, let me finish, Terry. Has which has led us. Which has about. led us to. Hang some, on, I'll come to you in a second, Terry. Which sorry. has led us to some really dreadful policy. Um, and in particular, we haven't focused on outcomes. We're focused on picking a preferred technology. What we're finally getting right now is we're saying we're going to have a system where we say these are the outcomes we want and we'll let the industry and the technologists work out which technologies are going to get to those outcomes in terms of reliability, affordability and meeting our international obligations. Terry Butler. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just suggesting that, I mean, you've campaigned against wind farms a lot. You've spoken at anti-wind farm rallies. I think you spoke about wind farms in your first speech. I mean, that sort of anti-renewable campaigning does shed a bit of a light on the things that you say in the parliament. Well, well, well you know, Terry, you should read what I said, and I didn't talk about wind farms in my first speech, oh, I'm let's sorry. be clear. But, but, but what I have campa what I've campaigned against, against wind farms, is, is vested interest, is energy policy that ends up being industry policy. Yeah, I understand it's, it's, it's when vested interests wander around Canberra, and you see it. I actually don't understand why you guys are so against industry policy. I mean, take the space issue. We 
our space policy is actually an industry policy. We want to see uh, private sector companies in Australia getting involved in the space industry. We're only getting 0.8 of a percent of a slice of the global 420 can, we well, can, can I just finish sorry, my point, we, though? Can we stick with climate change? Oh, well, no, I'm sorry, but can, can, can I finish my point? It is, which is, it is, which is the same point. Which is that if which we want good we energy policy, if we want industry. good climate policy, we should focus on the outcomes we want from that, not some other some other focus, and unfortunately, I think that's what's happened. So, so can, I, can I just confirm one thing? Yeah. So you accept um, climate science? I do. And climate science modelling? I do. Okay. Well, you know, I'm an economic modeller by background. Yeah. I understand how models work. I understand they make errors, right? Mm. But my point, and the point I've made consistently, is how poorly the policy has flowed from the science. And, uh, and that has been consistent and it has been atrocious. Right, and, to, and it's got us to where we right, are today. We're going to come to Judith because you wanted to jump in earlier. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, this is the point, I think, that, you know, you say that there's no alternative modelling. That's probably right, but we need competing modelling. But I think we have to be very wary of the power of the expert because you know that there are very high standard errors attached to these models. And in some ways, it's become quite embarrassing because the models have actually... Are you talking to Brian now? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. But so there's... Well, it's embarrassing. There's, well... I mean, I'll say... I just well, OK, to... let me... Oh, God, yeah. I think what the climate experts tend to do is be overly dogmatic. Indeed, economists are too. Mm -hmm. and so there's the climate modelling. The trouble is that climate scientists don't understand economic policy. And that's, I think, I completely agree with you, Angus. That's, that's where we've fallen down in the chasm. I mean, I understand you're a great uh, supporter of nuclear power. That'd be great for Australia. We have laws which ban nuclear power. Um, we have, you know, some of the largest deposits of uranium in the world, and yet we don't generate any electricity from nuclear power. So I, I think it's important that we listen to the scientists but we also realise that scientists don't understand policy particularly well. And that's where I think there's been a terrible weakness, partly because I think the scientists have kind of stretched into that area and become way too dogmatic about it. Oh, yeah, so it's certainly, it's actually right. I mean, you, the, the, the sense that scientists who advise government do know and are told correctly that the that, that policy is separate from the science. Policy is a, is a development, a democratic development in some sense, and it, there are many strands that feed into it. So I think that's clear. Um, I, I'm just going to say though the, the the idea that models. There's a very famous quote: "All models are wrong," which is um, almost certainly true. That, that none of them describe garbage reality in, perfectly. Out. They wouldn't be models otherwise. But also uh, Richard Feynman, one of my great heroes, called science a, a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance. And he turned the idea that, that, that um, we, we tend to approximate, at best we approximate what's happening in nature in science, into, into a, a great virtue. He said that, that that uncertainty, the idea that the world is extremely complex and we do the best that we can, is the reason for the success of science. And it's very difficult, particularly in politics, which is the, which is the I suppose, the art of the certain in many ways. It's a, it's a dogmatic pursuit in many ways. Uh, that's the... He, he said that the thing that politicians can learn from the scientists is humility in this sense, because faced with trying to understand right. nature, then you are going to be wrong, actually wrong in detail all of the time. But you, you've got to be as right as you can be at any one time. And that's why I think we agree on that, that really modelling, uh, you, you have to weight it in some sense rather positively, given that it's the best you can do. But then that, that advice comes to government, and it's absolutely true then that the policy responds to the advice is for government. That's what government is for. But as a scientist, I've no doubt that you would have favoured policies which favour renewable energy, which actually yeah. make incentives for renewable well, energy actually, to see it replace... It is true, although I think... Fossil that, fuels. Very quickly, I, I think that the, the debate has moved on, in a sense, mm. because, as I said before, I think the economics okay. now is driving... Um, driving renewable installation. It just happens that solar power, for example, has got significantly cheaper. And so you're seeing the market now drive the response. So I almost think it's kind of a dinosaur type debate now about the, the attacks on climate science and things. The, the, I, I, we, we don't be too, so, you know, we've got to be careful. Uh, Nicholas Stern, the, the, the economist, uh, I saw a quote from him. He said that we're at the start of something that might be enough. 
And he said the two things are at the start of and might be are the important things in that sentence. But we are moving in the right direction. But it's actually now innovation and technology that's driving us in the right direction. Can I just hear from Shara first before you come back in, Angus? OK. Um, when it comes to renewables, you know, certainly I think that market forces are starting to dominate that. And with climate change, you know, while the detail of the model may be off, I think the general trends are very clear yes. that human population is impacting the climate of this planet. But it may also be a combination of planetary or solar system cycles. I've read a number of research reports that suggest that planets and indeed, you know, even the sun goes through very long periods of changes. And it may be this combination of human activity and natural cycles which are accelerating some of the processes that we're seeing. Uh, Let's see what Brian the, says about no, the that. Rate of, the rate of change is, is, is human driven. I think that's the yeah. broad, broadly accepted now. It's a very, very fast mm -hmm. rate of increase. Do you accept that, Angus? Yeah, yeah. But I was just coming back to though, Brian's point, because if you're right, Brian, and, and I'm not doubting it, uh, then the right job for, <laughs> for, for and, and that's about your point about technology, not about climate yeah. science. Uh, then the right approach for the policymaker is to set the objectives, make the industry accountable for those objectives, and then let the technology thing play out in its own way and its, at its own pace. Well, that's exactly what we are now doing with this National Energy Guarantee. We're setting the objectives, reliable, affordable electricity that gets cleaner over time, and if the technology can solve the problem at no cost, Fantastic. I'm just going to let um, yeah. the opposition have a. I, I don't know whether to response. agree or not because I don't know about <laughs> oh, the policy. Yeah. Right? I mean, the pro reason we had such problems with renewable uh, energy in this country was because one of the first things that the uh, the coalition government did when they got elected was to commission the Warburton review, which of course immediately saw the market drop out of renewable energy because certainty was smashed. And so, really, the most important thing we can possibly do. Uh, for renewables at the moment from a federal perspective is to create certainty and that's why Bill's been calling for bipartisanship for some time because we want to create certainty and obviously we've got different views about how that can be done but I mean it's a shame we had bipartisanship since John Howard introduced the renewable energy target uh, under his government. I think you've forgotten uh, Tony Abbott in the middle there. <laughs> well, I haven't because that's who uh, smashed it up in 2014, Tony. All right. Um, we've got time for uh, one last question. It's uh, a science question. It's from Cynthia Franco. Um, hi. My question is totally scientific. It's not political. <laughs> so um, it's di directed to Brian Cox. It's um, in regards to the latest gravitational wave event uh, recorded by LIGO. Um, when two uh, neutral stars collided. Um, what astronomers are expecting to learn from this data that they are collected during this event? And um, will this data help um, uh, understand or complement uh, Einstein's gravitational wave theory? So very quickly, um, what, the, what was observed was the collision of two neutron stars. And our neutron stars are stars more massive than the sun, but compressed into something about 10 kilometres across. So extremely violent. They're almost like a large stellar, well, a city-sized atomic nucleus, if you like. And um, there were two of these orbiting around each other that were observed to collide. Einstein predicted that when violent things like that happen, the fabric of the cosmos itself, space and time, is shaken mm. such that waves in the fabric of the cosmos spread out at the speed of light. And we have, you mentioned LIGO, we've got, now got observatories, two in the US, one in Europe and one being built in India, I think now, um, which can detect those ripples in the fabric of space and time. And so that allowed us to observe the universe in a completely new way that was predicted by Einstein and now we have the technology to do it. And um, so this collision was seen. The, the unique thing about this collision was then the gravitational wave detector, which saw the ripples in the fabric of the cosmos, so emailed the observatories around the world, the optical observatories and space telescopes, which were able to turn around, pinpoint this thing and see it in the optical light as well. So for the first time, we have an observation of something very violent right at the edge of our physical understanding of the theory, um, which was seen in gravitational waves and x-rays and optical light. And um, just lastly, one of the, so there'll be a vast amount of data about this. We'd like to see a, a hint that Einstein's wrong, going back to the previous yeah. thing, because we'd like a better theory of gravity. So it possibly we'll see hints in this. 
But one of the beautiful things that was observed was the production of gold, vast mm -hmm. amounts of gold and platinum. And it's been one of the, uh, not a mystery, but it's not been really fully known and demonstrated where gold and platinum come from in the universe. And now it appears it's correct that it comes from the collision of neutron stars. So your jewellery that you have on now, if you touch it, it came from the collision of two neutron stars, most likely five, six, seven billion years ago before the solar system formed. So it's a very beautiful observation. Brian, it's expensive to do this kind of science. And um, what do you say to policymakers who want to know what they get out of it, um, who want to know what the actual physical or future scientific benefits are, oh. what, what concrete thing will come from? The, 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 I mean, you could point to the track record, which is science invented civilization or laid one of the necessary foundations for modern civilization. The point is that we, we spoke earlier about the, what, what a research and innovation policy should do. So it, it, it must educate people at the cutting edge. And that requires you to have researchers, funds for researchers in your country, widely demonstrated that, that you need those people who, who are doing research into different fields in order to bring new knowledge in and commercialize it in a country. So we know that. Secondly, if you look at the innovations that are gonna create these new jobs of which nobody has dreamt in the future to replace the old jobs, which are gonna go away to automation, th these come from technologies that tend to be developed when we're trying to do something very difficult. So for example, uh, particle physics at the Large Hadron Collider where I work, what, what has that done? Well, particle physics has delivered very specifically um, hadron beam and proton beam therapies for cancer, which are absolutely cutting edge now in focusing cancer treatment onto brain tumors in particular. Uh, medical imaging technology, the World Wide Web, of course, came famously from CERN and so on and so on and so on. So, so the, the, there's the generation of new knowledge which always occurs at the, at the border between the known and the unknown, and you don't know what you're going to get. Einstein's theory of relativity is used in the GPS system, for example, so that's very useful to us. But then also the, the, the spin-off technologies, when we do something difficult, tend to be the things that make a big impact. And just to round everything up with the, the space exploration question, um, Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and others always say that the, the real steps forward, the real innovation in a, in a society, in a civilization, occur at the frontier. And it, 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 it hasn't been a physical frontier for a long time, now it can be again. But it occurs at the frontiers of knowledge and at the physical frontier. And you need to get people to that frontier. I just want to hear what our, uh, thank you. I want to hear what other panelists think about. Angus, starting with you, I mean, do you and do, does your government accept that pure science yep without any obvious benefit is actually vital in the sense that has just been described? Well, it's, it's not about a lack of obvious benefit, Tony. I think fundamental research, which is what Brian's describing, has a role because there's serendipity that you never quite know where it's going to go mm -hmm. and what it can lead to. And we've seen with technologies like GPS, uh, they, they, they emerge from fundamental research in a way we can't always anticipate. Uh, and, and that's why it's right for governments to do a certain amount of it. Um, we also have to do the more sort of further down the value chain type research, the commercialisation and, and, and getting that technology out into the field as well, which we've struggled with to some extent in this country. And we're starting to make real steps forward now on this with the strengthening venture capital sector and so on. But that we need, we need the combination. It's the combination that gives you the innovation system that gets to our it's a healthy It's a healthy ecosystem. Yeah. I'd go to the uh, Shadow Minister for Universities. Oh, well, we want to see a healthy ecosystem too. I mean, I've certainly... Uh, in other roles, had the, the venture capital sector into the parliament to talk to parliamentarians about what we can do to improve the ecosystem here. But probably the key policy that we have is that we want to see 3% uh, of GDP being spent on research and development yeah. by 2030. It's a really important target that we have. Yeah, same in the UK. That seems to be optimal, doesn't it? So somewhere there's sort of a coalesce, an agreement that about 3% commercial and private sector yeah. in yes. R&D. Yeah, absolutely. Sarah? Uh, I agree with everything that's being said. We need a combination of pure R&D that we don't know what the end results are going to be, as well as the commercialization and venture capital for startups. Um, one of the things that I hear from Australian startups all the time is that it's so hard to raise money here, we have to go overseas. And by doing that, we're losing really great talent mm. and really great opportunities. And there are a couple of sectors in Australia that are very cutting edge on a world scale, like robotics. We have some of the best robot labs in the world, but there's very little funding that is coming in 
to support that nascent industry. And it's a really big growth area that includes artificial intelligence as well as physical robots. I guess you've got we, 10 seconds. Yeah, to it, that, that's changing. That's where we've come from. There's no doubt about it. And but it is changing. Capital. We're seeing rapid growth in this venture capital sector. We need it, and that's a good thing. And okay. our big firms are starting to do corporate venture capital, which is really important mm. as well. I'm sorry, I've got to round it off there. That's all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Terry Butler, Judith Sloan, Brian Cox, Angus Taylor and Shara Evans. Thank you. Now remember, you can continue the discussion on Q&A Extra with Tracy Holmes and the founder of Old Ways New, Angie Abdillah. They're taking comments and questions on ABC News Radio and Facebook Live just as soon as we finish. Now next Monday, in the wake of the same-sex marriage survey, Q&A will be in Melbourne with the Attorney-General, George Brandis, Shadow Minister for Employment, Brendan O'Connor, Green Senator, Janet Rice, one of the few Australian women who is legally married to a woman. Uh, Christian broadcaster Stephen O'Doherty, who's concerned about the impact of same-sex marriage on religious freedom, and endangered cross-bench senator Jackie Lambie. Until next week, good night. <laughs>